Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. Precinct one Bear County Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores, the first to admit it. She is no fan of getting a shot, any shot, but she got her COVID-19 vaccine today and made a party out of it to try and help those who are hesitant to get one themselves. Clay Flores opted for the one and done Johnson and Johnson vaccine. That's despite reports of very rare blood clots in about one in a million women who have actually gotten that shot. She tells Garrett Berger the benefit for everyone outweighs the risk. Mariachi's played happy birthday for District 1 Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores at a Southwest Side Clinic today. We didn't ask her how many candles she's blowing out this year, but it was easy enough to count the vaccine shots. Yeah, I don't like shots, so one shot, get it done. Clay Flores received her Johnson & Johnson vaccine at University Health Sarsamora Clinic trying to serve as an example. And so if you have that tendency and you think you probably are not, not going to come back for the second shot, I encourage you to come and take the one shot and be done. Considering the recent pause on the vaccine's usage, Clay Flores is hoping to assuage some fears. It's now in my system as of about half an hour ago. I'm excited. We talked with others who were happy to get it as well. This is the one I wanted. This is the one I've been wanting to get and so I had to wait until it came back. And the celebratory air helped too. The decorations, tamales. And free tamales, you got uh, some water and I got the one and done J&J, &J, which is what I was looking for. And of course, mariachi music. Clay Flores hopes people follow her example and if they haven't gotten their shot yet, they will now. It's time to get vaccinated and if you haven't done so yet, then we need to get our community back to work. We need to be able to hug our loved ones again and travel. Garrett Berger. Come get your shot. KSAT 12 News. In the trial of former Precinct 2 Constable Michelle Barrientes Vela and her one-time Captain Mark Garcia has moved a step closer to beginning. She was in court for the final virtual hearing on her cases today. Paul Venema with a look at what's next. We're sending a strong message out there. The cases of Michelle Barrientes Vela and Mark Garcia are topping the list of Judge Vela Mesa's top 10 cases to be tried once in-person jury trials resume next month. Barrientes Vela appeared during this virtual proceeding as Judge Mesa set a pre-trial hearing for May 21st. All the parties are expected to appear in court in person. Um, all of the witness, uh, witnesses are expected to testify in person if there's any evidentiary matters that need to be ruled on. Prosecutors told Mesa that there are also discovery matters that are expected to be addressed during the hearing. There's um, a request through discovery for the internal affairs and personnel records of officers that, uh, of officers that may be testifying and I'm working on getting all those records. Barrientes Vela was removed from office as Precinct 2 Constable in 2019. Actually, she technically resigned when she announced that she was running for sheriff. In January, she was indicted on six criminal accounts related to her tumultuous tenure as constable. They include aggravated perjury, tampering with evidence, and official oppression. Messup is expected to set a trial date this summer in all likelihood during that upcoming hearing. Paul Venema, case at 12 News. New at 6, a San Antonio man on the run for more than a year added to the state's most wanted sex offenders list. 52-year-old Henry Anthony Taylor wanted for failure to register. Officials say Taylor is a high-risk sex offender and hasn't been seen since April of last year when he ran from his last known address. He was convicted on a rape charge in Indiana in 1992 and in 2012 convicted of two counts of sexual assault in Texas. Information that leads to his capture could be worth up to $3,000. Call Texas Crime Stoppers at 1-800-252-TIPS. New information in connection with the search for the driver of a car that police say hit and killed a woman jogging on the northwest side over the weekend. San Antonio police releasing a picture of the suspect's vehicle. Take a look. This is the car that investigators are looking for, a light-colored Ford Focus. Lisa Rosenstein was jogging on the 1604 access road between Lock Hill Selma Road and Northwest Military Highway Sunday morning when officers say she was hit and killed. Investigators believe the car has significant damage to the right headlight. The passenger mirror either damaged or missing altogether. If you have any information that can help police catch up to this driver, this car could be the key. Call 210-224-STOP.
New at 6, just because we've seen so many families and unaccompanied minors at the border doesn't mean that other migrants aren't still willing to risk their lives entering the country illegally. So says a forensic anthropologist who has examined the remains of those who have died trying. Jesse DeGogato talks to a Texas State professor and one of her students about the ongoing efforts trying to give families the answers they need. Not only was the work in a Zapata County Cemetery slow and tedious for these students from Texas State. It was emotional when we actually reached the remains. This was Robledo's first exhumation. Forensic anthropology students have done nine of them throughout South Texas, starting in Brooks County. It's where Texas State first joined Baylor and the University of Indianapolis in recovering more than 100 remains, the school's largest exhumation yet. What are often just skeletal remains was someone who had a life and a family somewhere. They saw them one day and then they went missing and they don't know what happened. Yet Kate Spradley says of the 300 or so remains at the Texas State Lab, only 43 have been identified. Big reason being, she says, transnational identifications are difficult. She says data banks here do not allow families outside the U.S. to submit DNA samples. The DNA database is proprietary to the FBI and they are unwilling to allow that data to cross transnational boundaries. Instead, to help its ongoing search, Operation ID relies on a database set up by the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team, a globally recognized scientific nonprofit based in Argentina. So that makes it easy for us because they work on behalf of multiple governments. At least in Zapata County, Spradley says they had what Brooks County didn't have at the time, maps of where the unidentified were buried. They were able to take us right to these unidentified human remains, which is a luxury we've never had before. The first step in giving families the answers they may not want to hear, but when they do. And you can see a huge sense of relief. You can just see that on their faces, even though they're devastated. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to 281 South at Loop 410 West. Trans guide calling this unusual congestion, which kind of how I feel during allergy season. <laughs> uh, you can see things are going very slowly at this intersection. We're already seeing an increase in people heading out to the airport to get away now that the restrictions are easing up on COVID. So what are airports doing to protect travelers that may be suffering from COVID and not know it? Ursula Perry has details on what could be coming to our airport one day soon to keep us all safe from COVID-19. These travelers arriving from down south at Flint Bishop Airport in Michigan are greeted warmly by an officer. How are you? But what they don't realize is hiding behind the visor on her helmet is a tiny camera scanning their temperatures. It red flags anyone registering 100.4 or higher. 97.4 degrees. The smart helmet is a new tool to help detect COVID-19. The brain of it is uh, right up here in the top. It has a camera on the front of it right here, and it also has an infrared camera on the Picatinny rail on the side of it here. Um, that's thermal imaging. The helmet can scan up to 30 people at a time from 21 feet away. It was developed by a company in Italy and first used in Rome. When we started the first with the pandemic, we did take temperatures just remotely with an officer here at the door, but we were missing the uh, people coming off the plane, and that was a big gap. The display on the inside looks like a 72 inch screen in front of the user's right eye. It's giving the flying community some added peace of mind. Only one person at the Flint Bishop Airport in Michigan was found to have a fever through this method. But then again, a secondary reading showed she did not have a fever. It's believed it was because she was wearing a big heavy coat and a mask, something you likely won't see at the San Antonio Airport this summer. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. It is Cinco de Mayo, a holiday with origins in Mexico that celebrates Mexican forces defeating the French army in Puebla, not Mexican Independence Day, that's in September. Cinco de Mayo became popular here in the U.S. in the 1980s, and it wasn't just Mexican Americans who pushed the holiday into the mainstream. Immigrants from all over Latin America contributed to and then planned different Cinco de Mayo celebrations in different parts of the country.
Miami with Cuban heritage. Um, it's even spread to, uh, say, like the northeastern United States, where people of Puerto Rican heritage have also joined in planning and celebrating. Today, Cinco de Mayo is considered a popular American holiday and a more minor holiday in Mexico. And this is largely due to what the professor calls pan-Latino collaboration. You know what, it's a good excuse for a celebration. That's right, and on a day like today, perfect weather to get out and celebrate. It's just gorgeous. Actually. It is beautiful, it's not a Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Jeez Louise, no, that what did we do? What did we fall into oh. here? Fell into a snake pit with his puns and his jokes. Anyway, indeed. indeed. All right, so beautiful day out there. So often Cinco de Mayo, it, we're dealing with the heat and the humidity. Not the case today. In the aquifer, it's still on the rise. I love seeing this up nearly half a foot today. We're only half a foot below the May average now. How's that? And look at the big gains that we've made just over the past week here in the aquifer, really spiked up there. But I do want to point out stillage still is stage two watering restrictions, according to Saws. Mold is high, 2,800 pecan and grass on the low end. We'll talk about the beautiful evening ahead of us and when this all changes, of course, because it is May. We're going to talk about it coming right up. An emotional day for the Balcones Heights Police Department and Methodist Hospital. Sergeant Jose Sepulveda returning to the hospital where he recovered after he was shot several times responding to a burglary call. Max Massey shows us today was a day to honor the sergeant's recovery and the quick life-saving actions by his partner and hospital staff. Thank you. Thank you for, for their fast uh, actions, their, their, their training. Um, it, it, there's just not uh, enough words to, to express. Today is a day of celebration. Sergeant Sepulveda's vehicle pulled up to the emergency room roundabout, the same one where three months ago he had arrived with multiple gunshot wounds. The back seat passenger um, pulled up uh, a gun, a handgun, and uh, and fired. Uh, he fired once, uh, hit me uh, in the neck, and then uh, continued to keep uh, firing. The sergeant and his partner were responding to a call and it escalated quickly. A lot of adrenaline goes through. Officer Ortiz worked fast, scooping up his partner and rushing him to Methodist Hospital. If, I, if it wasn't for him, I would not be here. You know, out of all this, he is the true hero. I do have some EMS experience and, uh, you know, EMS can only be places so fast and he had seconds. The sergeant was shot three times. He had a, a, a large wound on his right elbow. Uh, he had one in his shoulder and he had one uh, uh, in, his, in his neck as well. The staff here was prepared and they rushed to save Sergeant Sepulveda's life. You know, police, fire, EMS, emergency, we're all one family. You know, so, so th this, this took uh, a little more intensity, I guess, uh, from all the staff because it's one of ours. Yeah. Seeing Sergeant Sepulveda out here smiling, shaking hands, hugging and laughing. It's emotional to say the least. He tells us this situation is not going to stop him from continuing to protect his community. I'm not going to have an incident like this, uh, you know, end my career. It's going to be ending on my terms. Sergeant Sepulveda tells me if everything works out well and he has the chief's blessing, he hopes to be back in June. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Wonderful to see his recovery and all the support he had through that journey. And both partners yes, together. Absolutely. All right, the Alamo on this Wednesday. Beautiful shot always of the heart of downtown San Antonio. And this is not typical May weather for us, but we will take a day like today. Absolutely. Yeah, usually we're looking at this in May thinking, whoo, it's nice to be in an air-conditioned uh, studio looking at this. But no, I'd love to be outside, actually. That's, yep. that's the difference. It's so often this time of year, we have the heat and even humidity. The beautiful days like this, they're numbers, folks. We know that. So the wonderful evening that we have ahead of us, take advantage of it. We have a few more and then things change pretty quickly. You know, today we topped out at 84 degrees after a morning low of 59, but I want to look elsewhere across South Texas. Look at this, not even 90 degrees. Catula 89 the high, Del Rio 88, 82 in Kerrville. So far, Hondo and Fredericksburg reporting high temperatures 
of 78 degrees and we don't have to feel guilty enjoying this. Take a look at the rainfall stats here. This is nice to see now month to date May 2.12 inches, but when you factor in late April, it's over seven inches. But so far month to date, we're about one and a half inches above average year to date. We're running about two inches above average with 11 inches of precipitation total and notice how I say precipitation and not rainfall because it takes into account the liquid equivalent of the snow that we got in February. So minor little point in detail there, but very important meteorologically speaking. All right, let's look at lake levels. Medina 35% full really didn't see much of a change from the recent rainfall actually compared to three months ago. It's down a foot and it's currently 37 feet below the conservation pool. Not much of a watershed to the Medina Lake Reservoir. You have to have specific heavy rain in a very specific part of Bandera County. Basically Canyon 89% no change over the past three months. That's five feet below the conservation pool. I mentioned our temperature this morning. 59 That's four degrees below average. Nowhere near the record low of 45, but we'll continue to run below average here uh, tonight and even again, I think tomorrow night. 82 right now. Beautiful. Here's what's nice. Dew point of 49. Yeah, that lack of humidity in the air despite a southeasterly breeze. It's shifting around. There isn't much to that wind, so the humidity is going to remain at bay for a few more days. Hello, it's now 87. It's one of the warmer spots. Canyon Lake reading 79. New Braunfels 80. Comfort 82 and Band right now at 83 degrees. I mentioned Catula upper 80 still at 89 in Laredo. The one exception now at 93. Fast forward to tomorrow morning. We'll have unseasonably cool air again in place. So we're looking at upper 50s for most of us. Creasel Springs 59, 57 in New Braunfels, about 59 here in San Antonio. And then by the afternoon, of course, we'll get back into the 80s. But I want to look at just the morning temperatures. Upper 50s tomorrow, low 60s on Friday, still pleasant lack of humidity. Once we get into the weekend, those morning temperatures are back up. And the main reason for it is the stickiness and the humidity that's going to be back in the air. I mean, Sunday morning we will start the day in the 70s. Dew points are down right now. That dry air allows us to cool off very efficiently at night. That dry air gets replaced with the humidity and mugginess we're so accustomed to this time of year. So by this weekend humidity, it's back and it's pretty sticky and that's going to give us some fog and drizzle as well at times. Quiet weather pattern. The activity is far to the north of us up the plains and even up into New England. It's the moisture is all out of here and we can have a few sunny, comfortable days guilt free right now. And this bump in the upper level flow over the western US that's going to move over us. That upper level ridge will keep us sunny for a few more days. As for our next chance of storms, we start to introduce that by Mother's Day. Sunday, we could have a few pop up afternoon and evening thunderstorms isolated in nature and then every day thereafter as we get into next week about a 20 to 30 percent chance of the way it stands right now. Mother's Day overall looking good. Comfortable tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, low humidity and I think we'll be about 86 in San Antonio, close to 80 in Kerrville and Rock Springs, Catula, Laredo about 90 degrees and Gonzales about 80 tomorrow afternoon. Those high temperatures rise into the weekend as well. So we add the humidity and we get back into the lower 90s by Sunday on Mother's Day. Although, by the way, Saturday morning plans is going to be a little damp with drizzle and fog and overall on Sunday Mother's Day. That slight chance of storms, but most of the day is going to be just fine. All right. That looks like a May forecast. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right. Turning to sports, there are a lot of teams that are solidifying their playoff spots. Not the Spurs quite yet, Larry. No, not the Spurs. I mean, they're still in the hunt for the uh, play-in game, yeah. but they better start winning or they might find themselves on the outside of that as well. The Spurs at the Jazz tonight. You want to know what? The Spurs are already like in playoff mode because these games are like the playoffs for them. Plus, what did Tim Duncan like the most about his Hall of Fame ride? Coming up. I'm still, you know, in, in shock. You know, it, I'm honored that my, my colleagues voted for me. Basketball coach Natasha Benavidez was named Jefferson High School Teacher of the Year in Big Board Sports. The Jazz 
and Spurs will play ball tonight for the third and final time this regular season, and the stakes are different for both squads. Utah, winners of two in a row, are fighting with Phoenix for the number one seed in the West. Utah and Phoenix have the same record, but Phoenix is currently number one because they own the head-to-head -head tiebreaker with the Jazz. Now, on the flip side, San Antonio, losers of four straight, is just fighting to make the playoffs. The Spurs are 10th in the West, which is good for the final play-in spot. Mathematically, with eight games left, they still have a very small chance to move up to fifth or sixth, but their best odds have them finishing seven through ten, unless, of course, New Orleans can overtake them. The Spurs' final eight games are crucial for the silver and black. The end of the season is, is almost like an extension of the playoffs already for us. Like it's it's about um, important wins, uh, carrying that momentum into the postseason. Like there's a lot of important stuff up for grabs right now in these games, and I think that's how we got to approach these games. Jazz will host the Spurs tonight at 8. Utah is going for a three-game season sweep. Next weekend, Tim Duncan and the rest of the star-studded class of 2020 will finally be enshrined into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, which was delayed due to COVID-19. The Spurs drafted Duncan number one overall in 1997, and he led them to five NBA championships and a countless number of great moments. I'm not going to name one thing that I appreciate the most. I enjoyed the journey. And uh, I enjoy it even more now, looking back and uh, uh, just missing being a part of that. But also, at the same respect, having gone through it, just understanding how present you have to be uh, uh, every day, every game. Uh, I think I was, I was better at that later, uh, later in my career, as uh, you kind of see the end coming where you're just like, okay, well, I'm here tonight. I'm going to appreciate this game tonight. I'm going to appreciate this moment tonight, this practice today. I'm going to, to, to be present instead of being like, oh, okay, I just got to get through this. Uh, you know, it happens fast. It goes by fast. Uh, so uh, I look back and I, I appreciate the entire journey. The class of 2020 enshrinement ceremony will be held Saturday, May 15th at Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut. Tim will be presented by Hall of Famer David Robinson. Congratulations to Jefferson High School head girls of basketball coach Natasha Benavides for being named the 2020-2021 Thomas Jefferson School Teacher of the Year. This past season, she led the Mustangs to a 20-5 overall record, the District 27-5A championship, their first district title, and the program's first playoff game. On top of that, she's inspiring her students in Algebra 1 and all of Jefferson High. When we told our, our athletes that I was um, selected, they were just so excited and it was a great opportunity to talk to them about, you know, setting high standards and why we do what we do and um, just kind of trying to be that role model of a, of a student athlete. Even though I'm not uh, a student or athlete anymore, I'm in the, the teacher sense and trying to make sure that they understand that our education is just as important as athletics. Boy, Jefferson has a good one in Coach Benavidez, that's for sure. Great in the classroom and on the court, in the court as well. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. He is a very accomplished actor. He's been in theater. He's been on screen married to a desperate housewife. He has played Selena's father, and he calls San Antonio home. And we are honored to be joined by Ricardo Chavilar now, who joins us. And, and I want to mention, Ricardo, that last night, season two of the, of the Selena Netflix show dropped. I'm guessing, being from San Antonio, you had an idea of the icon that Selena is. We're, are you getting more of an idea playing Abraham Quintanilla and what fans are telling you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I knew, so she and I were born the same year, about four or five months apart. Uh, so the success that happened with Selena y Los Dinos and then what became Selena was very much a, a part of the backdrop that was my young adulthood. So, I mean, you know, I was going to Lee High School. I was going to Incarnate Word College here in town. Uh, and I remember picking up the paper or watching the newscast on the weekends and seeing her performing at Rosedale Park or the Pochit Strawberry Festival. Um, so, so I knew the, I knew the, um, the importance and significance of the family and, and of the music as well. Uh, and I knew that there was a large fan base. I didn't realize how large that fan base had grown since, uh, since her untimely death. You know, it's it's kind of crazy when when season one dropped. I didn't 
I had no idea what the numbers would be. I, I mean, I would have, I would imagine we would do good numbers specifically in our area, but I mean, you know, it was number one for quite some time in Mexico and most of Central, Central America, Latin America, and South America. And so I, I was kind of flabbergasted by that. And it's the cool thing about it is that the, um, that her music still, it, it has stood the test of time. And why do you think that is? Because of course it's been, it's been decades since her passing, but this Netflix series is opening up a whole new audience to her backstory, her rise to stardom. It seems with age, she is still just as beloved as she was decades ago. Why do you think her legacy continues to live on? There's a universality to her music. Um, you know, it is it is it, Tejano music is very much the music of the of the working people. Uh, the cool thing about this series is that it's opening up the story, the music and and the. Um, and the legend that is Selena, not just to our Latin American communities and our South Texas community, but to all of the United States, you know, there are there are, you know, Anglo households in Wisconsin that have been watching Selena, so that have never heard this kind of music before, that knew nothing about it. So, so that's a really beautiful part of of, uh, of this series coming around in, in this time period. And uh, and the the most beautiful part of that is that what people can relate to, whether you are Spanish speaking or Mexican or Anglo or African American, is the universality of family and of that families want and dream and desire for the American dream, which is success for themselves. Yeah, it transcends culture and, you know, race and, and, so. and all of that. I, one last Selena question here for you. Talk about the sure. challenge of playing Selena's father. I mean, this is a guy who's was was very controlling of her career, you know, is a guy who's still alive. I mean, is 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 there a, a what is the challenge like playing Abraham Quintanilla? Well, you know, I first I didn't have any access to him, which is fine with me. Uh, and I'd never watched the, the movie, the previous movie with uh, Jennifer Lopez or Edward James Olmos. But when I got cast in the role, I, I, may, I was like, I'm fine with that. I don't want to have those influences on my decisions uh, on how I'm going to approach this character. And I just studied a lot of his interviews. I did as much reading and as and talking to people that knew the family, that worked with the family back during those those years in the late 80s and early 90s. And then also just realizing that Abraham Quintanilla is a, is a Mexican-American man of a certain generation that is the same generation that is my father and many of my tios. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, patriarchal information that I was able to draw from my own family. You are a successful actor, and you don't normally think of successful <laughs> actors, Hollywood actors, in San Antonio. New York, L.A., perhaps. I follow you on Instagram. You're always posting Texas, South Texas sunsets. So why do you continue to call San Antonio home? Uh, well, first off, I think it's because I just absolutely love the uh, the KSAT uh news uh, uh station <laughs> I, you guys you guys are you guys are my celebrities number one um i watch you every every night as often as i can but but uh to be serious um san antonio is home for me it's uh i have i have friends in new york i have friends in los angeles i have friends in london that i've worked with but i've never felt um at home or in my own skin the way i do in san antonio uh it's just um my, you know, we moved here when I was, I think, in second grade. Uh, so it's like, you know, I can say I went to Blessed Sacrament Catholic School. I went to Robert E. Lee High School. I went to Incarnate Word College. You know, this is this is a this is home for me. And you do more than live here. You also give back to the community. And I, I want to talk specifically about the Madonna Center and what's coming up. Let's talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's you know, my dad's been sitting on the board of the Madonna Center for quite some time, and, and he always has a finds a way to wrangle me in to do to do something over there and uh, and I'm and I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. You know, it's it's a beautiful organization. You know, it's founded by the Sisters of Divine Providence. It's been there for god close to 100 years, I think. And servicing the West Side community, one of our our most underrepresented community and, you know, specifically uh, addressing fragile issues like senior care and child care for this underrepresented community. Uh, where they probably would have none, would it not be for the Madonna Center? So they've got a limited gala. COVID is, you know, it's it's affected everybody, and I'm just trying to do my part to to help them out 
Uh, I'm going to be hosting their their limited in-person gala. It's also a virtual gala. It'll be on the, uh, May 22nd. You can check out their Facebook website, the Madonna Center. You can also check out my stuff on Instagram or my Twitter or my Facebook. I'll be posting as much information as I can about it leading up to the event. One of the best kept secrets on the west side is the Madonna Center. So yes. I, I yes. appreciate that you're stepping up to help. Um, uh, you have my dad to thank for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Thanks. Chavila, thank thanks you. Thanks to your dad <laughs> as well. And thanks so much for your time. We want to remind everybody that the second part of Selena, the series, it is out now on Netflix. Go check it out. Ricardo, it's great to have you with us here this evening. Myra, Steve, thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, my friend. We'll be right back. Okay. Some bad news for those looking to buy a new home. The price is skyrocketing because of a lumber shortage. When the pandemic started, sawmills shut down production in anticipation of a housing slump. But that slump never happened. And now there's not enough lumber. It's delaying construction of badly needed homes and complicating renovations of existing ones. The price of an average new single family home more than $35,000 higher than it would normally be. Oof. Yeah, that uh, new deck I wanted, nope, not happening <laughs> yeah. not for a long uh, time. It's going to be a while for that one. Look outside this evening, beautiful day, this low humidity. Please let it stick around a while. I wish we could, but come on, it's May, Myra. All right. <laughs> we, we have to give in to it at some point, don't fine, we? Fine. It's It'll be back in the days ahead, but this evening, just savor it. Another beautiful evening. Right now we're at 82. By 8 o'clock, mid-70s. 10 o'clock, near 70 degrees. And another unseasonably cool start to the day tomorrow. We'll get into more detail about that, the return of the humidity, and what that means for your weekend, not just in terms of mugginess. All that coming right up. Just about anything Britain's royal family does generates a lot of buzz, including something brewing on one of Queen Elizabeth's estates. The British monarch's Sandringham estate has developed an exclusive line of beer. The Norfolk Retreat says it is now selling an India pale ale and a bitter. They were created from organic Lorette barley grown on the estate's grounds. The beers are available at the Sandringham shop. No word yet on whether it will be available for sale anywhere else. IPA fan over in the uh, yeah, he's weather clapping. center. Clapping. He's clapping, yeah. It may not be the crown, but maybe it will scratch the itch for fans wanting an inside look at the royal family. Prince William and his wife, Catherine, are launching a new YouTube channel. The announcement coming on Instagram, William and Kate posted a short video that includes them attending royal events and never before seen footage of their close relationship. The channel getting about 80,000 subscribers in just a matter of hours. In one of the clips, Kate is teasing William about his attempt to speak Irish. Irish. The future king and queen of England have also rebranded their Instagram account, changing it from at Kensington Royal to at Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Nearly 13 million people are following them there. I believe that. Wow. Someone is going to get a chance to go to space this year. Apparently, Jeff Bezos Blue Origin is set to launch its first commercial passenger mission. July 20th, the fully autonomous spacecraft New Shepard can carry six passengers. One of those six saved seats saved for the winner of an online auction. Bidding is open to anyone. Just go to the company's website. The first round of bidding is going on now through May 19th. It's sealed so no one can see how much other people offered. Ah. So a sealed bid to go on the spacecraft. Whether it's this, whenever it happens, when we just send passengers to space, that'll be oh, wild. Yeah. Wild. I'm fine here. Yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah. Especially probably how much you got to offer to do that one. Yeah. That's just it. Even in the future, it's still going to be expensive. You still got to we complain defy about, yeah. gravity, basically. We defy about physics. flying across the country, right? Yeah. That's too expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so let's talk about our weather headlines here. We do have some warmer mornings ahead. Our temperatures will be on the upswing, both in the morning and the afternoon, and that's going to be a result of the humidity that returns this weekend. And also, our first chance of storms in the forecast comes over the weekend as well. So let's get to everything, starting with temperatures, some temperature talk, then we'll get into the storm chance talk as well. 82 degrees 
out there right now. Dew point of 49, so that lack of humidity is what's so nice and comfortable. And a gentle breeze at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. Castroville, you're 84. New Braunfels at 80 degrees. Comfort, 82. Bandera, 83. You get the idea. For the most part, lower 80s, but parts of the hill country now dipping into the upper 70s. Kennedy's at 84. Fredericksburg now at 77. Tomorrow morning, Fredericksburg 53, Kerrville 53. We actually had some upper 40s earlier today in the hill country. Tomorrow will just be a couple degrees higher, but you're not going to notice much of a change. For the most part, mid upper 50s for morning temperatures. 57 Uvalde and Hondo and about 59 here in San Antonio. You get to Leon Springs 57 along with Timberwood Park, Elmendorf 59 and Bernie. You'll start your day at 55 degrees. Seguin at about 57, so unseasonably cool. But that starts to change, particularly this weekend. That's when the humidity returns. As a result, morning temperatures are back up and we have those sticky, muggy and somewhat damp mornings ahead of us over the weekend. Temperature by Sunday morning, 73 degrees. So a big difference than the mornings we're experiencing now. Dew points now, they're down 40s to near 50. But that changes, of course, once we get into the weekend and that humidity comes off the Gulf of Mexico, it's going to be sticky outside and that's going to lead to those warmer mornings and give us a little bit of dampness. Saturday morning, areas of fog and drizzle, early risers on Saturday, we'll just have that dampness in the air. It's not going to add up to anything, it's just damp and then we'll sunshine by the midday. Quiet weather pattern, hard to even find clouds across Texas right now. And that's okay, we can enjoy this guilt free because we've had a lot of rain here over the past week, over seven inches officially at the airport in town and other parts of Bear County have seen between five and 10 inches of rain. Leon Valley southward uh, between 1604 and 410, really the, the sweet spot of about 10 inches of rain during that five day period. Bump in the upper level flow over the west coast, that's gonna be sliding overhead and that's gonna keep us sunny and rain free for the next couple of days. So we're looking at nothing but sunshine again tomorrow. Comfortable 59 in the morning, 86 by the afternoon, but low humidity and an east northeasterly really breeze at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Friday, very similar. No big changes the next couple of days. Once we get into the weekend on Saturday, some warmer mornings, drizzle, fog, a little bit of dampness to start the day and very sticky into Mother's Day. We'll actually make it up to 93 degrees on Mother's Day and the heat index will play a little bit of a role in the day as well. It's going to feel like it's about four or five degrees warmer than the actual air temperature and we're predicting about 93 for the high. Obviously, it'll feel hotter than that with the humidity and we do have the slight chance of a few pop up thunderstorms starting on Mother's Day. It's very conditional and we don't anticipate a whole lot of activity, but if we do see something pop up, we could have the conditions where it could become strong to severe. One of those situations where I wouldn't plan around it right now, just keep that extra watchful eye to the sky and we will let you know if something pops up and have the KSAT Weather Authority app handy. And then we see that daily as we get into next week. No surprise, a return of the humidity comes a return of the chance of some pop up showers and storms. And Adam, you know what a huge fan I am of Thermometer Thursday. So usually that's what I look forward to on Thursdays. Always. But tomorrow, I think the drought monitor will be interesting. Actually, I'm very excited about that, too. Yes, very excited. The new drought monitor. I figured you updated. would be. That's we were why talking I threw about that, that out there. Yeah, in the weather center, we were talking about that today. We're itch itching for it. That was a weather softball for you right there. <laughs> you just yeah. hit it out of the park. He just, yeah, knocked yep. it out of here. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Wednesday. It is May 5th. Drugs and weapons taken from a home. Six people now facing charges. This is happening in the 100 block of Harcourt Avenue near I-37 in Goliad on the city's south side. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar saying deputies found about $100,000 worth of drugs inside, including meth and heroin, an AK-47 and military-grade body armor. The sheriff says the six people arrested believed to be affiliated with a white supremacist group which he did not name. Severe weather has been sweeping through the south. At least three people have died in these severe storms. Relentless wind, rain, tornadoes, and even flash flooding have impacted Alabama, Virginia, and of course right here in Texas. Crews preparing to continue cleaning up debris and assessing the damage across the region. The National Weather Service's Prediction Center warned that today the flash flood could also affect the central Gulf Coast as storms move southeast. Peloton recalling thousands of its treadmills over a risk of child injury or death. 
Last month, the Consumer Product Safety Commission issued a warning over Peloton's Tread Plus, saying at least 70 injuries were reported and one child died. Three casinos in Las Vegas are cleared to return to full capacity after meeting COVID-19 vaccination goals for employees. The Cosmopolitan made the announcement yesterday. They promised more than a million dollars in cash bonuses to its employees as an incentive to be vaccinated by May 8th. Wynn Resorts and Encore Resort made the same decision. Casinos that do not meet the vaccination requirement are allowed to operate at 80% capacity. So we're talking earlier about the drought monitor. This is the current drought monitor, which does not take into account any of the rainfall that we had last week, which uh, started Tuesday afternoon for some folks, especially south of town. But this is going to be updated tomorrow, and we anticipate some big, big gains. Like a bodybuilder. Big gains. Big gains <laughs> on the way. Uh, so 65% of the state is considered in drought. Three months ago, it was 44. So obviously, we took the wrong turn when it came, comes to the drought. And you look at our local area around San Antonio and Western Bear County was considered in the extreme portion of drought at Kerrville, Bandera, Pipe Creek, Hondo, Pearsall, all the way down into Catula. And LaSalle County, the exceptional drought category. We got a lot of rain, especially along in north of Highway 90. So we're going to see some some big gains there and put a big dent in that drought, but no rain chances till Sunday. And even then they're slight. Expecting all those colors to change. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you at 10.